One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two.
forgot to put my mic on. Um, Al, good to see you again. Good question. Um, here in Downbeat Click, I got the impression you pretty much always displace the click for practice. You mix it up or more into Downbeat Click these days. I'm using the click here for reference, not for practice. So it's for you listening to hear where the downbeat is. And when I'm practicing on the practice pad, it's always always displaced or like just playing a, a whole note or something of that sort. But for these streams, I'm keeping on the downbeat just for reference, just so you can hear where the one is. Good question. But I mean, when I'm doing sessions and stuff, it's I don't I don't do recording sessions with a displaced click. It's always on the downbeat. So what am I doing today? Kind of piggybacking on yesterday's where I was messing with the melodies that are created by the unaccented hand or like within stickings. Like what are the what are the melodies that are kind of hiding within them? And today's syncopation day, so I'm doing the same thing with syncopation. If you play this book for anyone who doesn't have a copy, I'm in the syncopation pages, which is 32 of the original pressing. It might be page 33 or 34 in the newer version. Just the first example, one and and three, four, that's the melody. And if you fill in all the gaps in that melody with the other hand, sounds like this. And if you drop the right hand onto your thigh or, or airplay it, you'll have a different melody. Yeah, the fill-ins. I'm using just eighth notes, not the triplets yet. So just eighth note fill-ins. And I'm messing with what does the melody of that sound like in different ways. play it double time, so 16th.
going to like deconstruct it more and more so it becomes something totally different. What's going on in your head when you do this sort of stuff, basically listening, or do you have a count going after of years of doing it? In this particular case, I'm hearing the melody do doom do doom do doom do doom do doom do the whole time. Yeah, pretty much the whole time that melody, whether I play it deliberately or play off of it, is kind of on constant loop in my brain. And then the whatever the melody kind of morphs to, that might take over. Like that, that play in the spaces, the melody you get there. That kind of takes over is what's playing in my brain. Yes, the music I'm hearing. I'm hearing melodically at this point. Even if I'm thinking all the 16th notes, it's not. I'm not hearing a digital click in my brain. It's some sort of 16th note melodic sort of loop, whatever's in my imagination. So yeah, it's always about the music at this point. Should always be about the music. Uh, but I'm always trying to find new stuff in the things that I've been playing for many, many years. Because none of it has been explored to the fullest. Let's try a different one. Oh, number two. Classic. So that's what's rolling in my head. So the negative space of that one is pretty weird. So I want to play eighth notes. Dun 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 dun. that 16th kind of like that that's a pattern that I would have probably played otherwise but not from this kind of coming at it from this direction
definitely nothing I ever would have stumbled on just jamming things. I had to be very deliberate. So all that negative melodic information inspired something kind of cool there. Again, stuff I would have played variations of that, but never that exact thing. Um, I kind of like that little diddle thing. turned off the stupid autofocus on that camera so it isn't it's constantly zooming in and out like crazy i think that that lens is probably about the end of its lifespan this one's still on autofocus but it seems to be acting better these don't have automatic tracking so they should be fine but this guy was driving me nuts yesterday so i finally just set the focus so it should be cool my apologies for the headache of yesterday. So that's example two on page 32 of syncopation. Some of these probably won't reveal, eh, maybe. So let's try some of these more sparse ones. Number seven, one, two, and, and four. One, two, and, and four. There's still some cool, even in some of these more sparse ones, there's some cool um, rhythms to explore. I'm going to go into triplets, though, for the next bit here. Um, so back to number one, one and and three, four, phrases, triplets, and then fill in the left hand. So first, just the triplets with the swing feel. What's up, Brent? Good to see you. such a weird phrase that is hiding in those fill-in notes because it's all in the offbeat.
Thoughts on keeping left leg moving? Um, only when I'm practicing and trying to solidify where the downbeat is. On gigs, I very rarely use the left foot unless it's on purpose. And same thing with recording. Oftentimes, I don't chomp the left foot because it's not needed. I only use it when it's needed when it creates some sort of texture that I need or some sort of momentum on live gigs where I just need to keep my body moving. But for practice, I think having some sort of pulse reference is good most of the time. What should read? Oh, so many textures with those boon symbols. Yeah, there's a lot there. I even had to put a tiny little bit of tape on the bells of these in this room because it was so much color, so much sound. What's up, Nick Murray? What's up, Basement Artie from Troy, New Jersey? I lived in Clifton, New Jersey, Patterson, New Jersey, and Lincoln Park, New Jersey. Total of almost 17 years, 16 and a half years. Um, what sort of click would you play long to if not a streaming setup? Um, well, in this case, I'm still learning the phrases, so I don't need to throw an offbeat in. Um, it might be helpful to throw this in. It's helpful to make sure I'm not like faking my subdivisions. And then the other thing I would probably do is something like this. wasn't truly half I went too far it should be right here it's 
not a gap click, it's just a slow click. You checked out yesterday's stream. It's just a slow click, no different than a fast click. It's just slower, man. kind of cool so I'm just literally moving every note to a different instrument um, and it creates a kind of a cool like polyrhythmic polymelodic kind of thing what if I did that between drums hmm That's really like a tongue twister. I want to figure that out. But um, so I mix up the click. What's the starting point? All the subdivisions. My starting point would be just a pulse, and then I assess: Am I slipping with the subdivisions? Am I, you know, am I rushing fills? Then I'll either add or remove. But I'd probably just start with this. out yeah starting with the downbeats click just playing your pulse um, so what just happened there which was kind of cool was I went from accenting the right to accenting the left and it sounds like a totally different pattern your question when does this show up in your playing naturally the most my swing material no it's everything I am reinforcing I'm focusing my attention get this thing from this stop I'm focusing my attention on the stuff that isn't accented which forces me to have micro control of my subdivisions to be listening more deeply not letting my hands just drop in on the stuff that's quote-unquote unimportant um, which translates into when I play something like this. things that everyone not everyone but we'll say kind of hypothetically everyone doesn't pay attention to the little stuff that's where you're rushing your drag when those distances start closing up and spreading out that's where you rush and drag it's not going to be your big kicks and your big snares that rush and drag it's the little subdivisions that you're not paying attention to that slowly get closer and closer or further and further apart which can make your groove feel kind of wobbly and just inconsistent 
Um, so I'm getting those little guys my full attention. I'm ignoring everything else. So you gotta play the quiet stuff with just as much focus and attention as the loud stuff. If you wanna have a consistent, strong, confident groove, in my opinion. That's the stuff. When I started really working on that, excuse me, I need a drink. That's the stuff that I noticed immediately on the bandstand. I started getting comments from bass players, man, you're so easy to play with. I feel like I can play anything with you. Um, you know, that's that's what that resulted in. Other musicians feeling comfortable to then they can take off and really explore because they're not having to adjust every single note they play because my downbeat keeps shifting or my backbeat keeps shifting. So that's the that's the point of all this stuff, this weird syncopation stuff. So what was I just doing? Oh, um, hands on the drums. So you can kind of explore a call and response stuff just by playing syncopation patterns and accenting one hand versus the other. That's just example one um, phrased with triplets. Um, what did you say? Uh, Al, comments on the E and L click to heighten awareness of precision or just E for, or just uh. Um, you're getting kind of into like game territory um, what I definitely do though every single day and this is just my daily routine to calibrate is this kind of a click get my pad this is my daily warm-up every single day grid variations if you have any grids language of drumming book he kind of codifies it there but it's like marching band stuff but click on the third and then on the middle of that with diddles and flams and tap rolls and 30 second notes um, it is it is it heightened awareness of precision it is just um, kind of what I said yesterday is it's it's putting the click in a position to where I can't rely on it and then so it's just making me have to commit to my own timing and then making adjustments if it gets off so I do that at 130 I do that at 140 and at 150 every single day. It gets my brain tuned in, my ears tuned in, and my hands warmed up. Um, Nick, have you ever made a system for dynamics volume control, like a way to measure stick height so you can have consistent piano mezzo and forte levels? 
Um, Al, no, no feet. No feet, no tapping. It's just I'm trying to keep everything else still and relaxed and just focused on getting the hands loose. Um, ever made any system for dining? No. You're kind of referencing like David Garibaldi has a very specific kind of stick height system. To me, that's um, it's probably valuable for some, and it's clearly valuable for him because his precision and accuracy and dynamic control is world class. But um, it's too much thinking and too many rules for me. I just think, how loud does the accent need to be? And then put it there. That's for the room or for the situation, the accents. I determine where the accents need to sit given the environment, the gig, the room, the style. And then all the ghost notes should be as quiet as you can get them. They don't need to be, I mean, there's really no other place for them. I want unaccented hi-hat notes and ghost notes to be seamless. I want them to sound like one layer that just has a slightly different timbre. So for me, ghost notes are always just as quiet as you can make them. The other thing I tend to do is, is always have some sort of shape to whatever I'm playing. So if I'm leading into a fill, I'm, if I'm going to play grace notes or diddles, it's going to have some sort of shape to build into that. just from years of playing classical music, orchestral music, orchestral percussion, and, and just having to shape every phrase. There should never be two notes played exactly the same in a row unless that's specifically required. Yeah, Chris, the space between the clicks is it has to be felt. That's the, that's the key. Those are the space between the notes is where you rush and drag. Because it's easy to relax during the rests, but the rests are just as important. Um, Al just started Dave DeSenso's new book. He's got a smoother way to count 16 of triplets. I use one triplet and triplet, but that's the tongue twister faster tempos. I don't count 16 of triplets. I just don't. Um, It depends on what I'm playing. That's not true. I just listen to my subconscious and it is playing triplet, 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 dig it, triplet, triplet, dig it, dig it, dig it, dig it, dig it. Some sort of version of triplet, triplet, dig it, dig it, depending on what kind of flows out of my subconscious tongue <laughs> easier. Dig it, dig it, dig it, dig it. But 
oftentimes I'm just thinking the larger grouping. So if you're phrasing I'm usually thinking eighth notes, but even then I'm hearing digga 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 Sometimes if I'm playing more kind of quarter note triplety, nope. I am thinking two things: digga digga when it's appropriate, and then whatever the melodic shape is of whatever I'm playing. So the accents or whatever it is that's giving that phrase some sort of direction. Versus digga 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 and trying to throw in all those accents. I gotta check out Dave's book. His first book um, I got into for a bit, but it was just so deep and I couldn't um, couldn't dedicate enough time to it. But when I've seen him present that stuff in clinics and master classes, it's the truth. Um, and it's the, I mean, to oversimplify it, it's singing what you play, <laughs> counting out loud and be able to sing what you play or sing against what you're playing, which is new breed concepts, um, all kinds of stuff. He got an editor. <laughs> yeah, that first one was, was a lot of stuff. But, um, uh, I saw something in here. Oh, Chris, I know drummers who can't play to a live loop or click simply because they panic and because they do not practice enough with it. You have to practice with stuff to normalize it. I'm all about normalizing things that give you anxiety on the instrument. If playing to a loop gives you anxiety, then you have to practice playing with a loop. One thing, here's a, another tidbit of advice. Um, I've seen a lot of drummers online from different accounts I follow and whatever playing along to tracks, but they're playing along to a track that they put a click on to. Um, or like complaining this track doesn't have a click and therefore my timing is all over the place. I would suggest not using the version with a click and using the version without a click if you can get these play along tracks and it forces you to listen inside the music because they record it to a click usually. So if you can't play in time with it, it's a you problem because you're not listening. Listen to the bass better, listen to the guitar more, listen to the, the keys. Um, all the Hal Leonard drum play-alongs are amazing. They have like pretty spot-on replications of classic stuff, Bob Marley, Jimi Hendrix, Van Halen, modern rock stuff, The Beatles, The Who, Radiohead, and there's not a click on any of them. And the first time I played along some of those, it, it really kind of freaked me out. But then I just committed, like, okay, I have to be able to do this. It's clearly a me problem. And I think the deeper you listen in, and the less you just try to play the drums on top of it, the better you'll sound. You need to play from inside the music, not on top of the music. And what I hear a lot of folks when they're playing to play long tracks online, it sounds like they're playing to the track and they're not listening to the track because they probably have the click cranked and it just doesn't feel good. You're not, it's not sinking into the music. Um, so I would caution against that. Same thing with playing live. I've seen a lot of bands, especially in this kind of new tech metal, where obviously they're all, they're all in in-ears, so they have no idea what they actually sound like on stage. And they're all playing to a click. So there's no sense of groove, there's no sense of feel. The drummer's playing like tons of linear licks and things that aren't quite in the pocket <laughs> but because they have the click everyone's cool uh, I don't think that's that's not a good audience experience when it sounds like there's five people on stage playing their own version of the song right versus how does everything sync together sync and sync both versions s y n c and s i n k so yeah play along the tracks that don't have a click 
find duo records that don't have drums and don't complain about, oh, it speeds up a little bit. Figure it out, get inside that stuff. Can be done. Um, yeah, at this day and age, if you can't play to a click, you're gonna have a hard time uh, being employable in most cases. Even on these random bar gigs I'm playing, we, we do a lot of dance music where we just throw on a click and it's just coming to my in-ears and I'm the only one that gets it. And that's for just like a local bar gig, not counting like the big production stuff or like Broadway stuff where like most of it is locked to a click. But you gotta be able to play to a click and make it feel good. <clears throat> you can't play to the click. It's gotta become a percussionist just playing the same groove. Remind me to tell you of that click tracks. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to hear about that. Sounds like a nightmare. Um, there is one song in this band that I work with where we piggyback Uptown Funk and um, Rick James, um, whatever the heck it's called. And they're like one BPM difference. So the leader will turn the click on at like the last two measures of Uptown Funk with the new tempo and we have to just not make it feel janky when we shift. It's every time it's like a, 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 a mine. It, it screws me up because I think, man, am I just slow? And I remember, oh yes, yeah, it's, it's one BPM faster for the next song. Bury the click. Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting concept. Um, I think it's a good goal. If you can't hear the click, at least you know you're with the click. You might be slightly ahead just because of the nature of perceived sound. But yeah, if you can make the click disappear, you're doing pretty good. Uh, any of you guys, folks, checked out Steve Gadd's Gadiments? The book is great, but the videos of him demonstrating this stuff? Um, no, not super freak. What is it? Wow. What's the other one? I don't think it's Super Freak. Uh, anyway, the Gadamans book, the videos of Steve playing the exercises on, I think he's playing on like a log or like a piece of wood with a metronome. He is always, always just behind the click. You hear the click and then you hear him hitting the pad the whole time, every single time. He's just permanently slightly behind the beat, um, which can be dangerous because you can end up just dragging, but he just, he locks it in. It's like he hears the click and then plays just like milliseconds, probably not even 10 milliseconds behind. Next level control. Um, anyway. What was I doing? Um, syncopation. that a bunch more in the future because um, there's so much living in the rest that I want to explore. Um, there's something else I was going to say about this, but what the heck was it?
Oh yeah, then you can get into like grouping them in three, two instead of six, eight. Lots of stuff, lots of music hiding in these these old, um, quote unquote, tired old books. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna hop off now. So, oh, this, this drum. I have to share this drum before I split. I got this guy. In the left one here. Black Diamond Pearl, six and a half by 14, mahogany gum. So it's two plies of mahogany on the inside, two plies of gum, two more plies of mahogany, two more plies of gum, and then an outer two plies of mahogany. Two, four, six, so it's 10 plies. Six plies, I believe it's six plies of mahogany, four plies of gum with relict brass two lugs, black diamond pearl finish relict steel uh, single flange hoops with clips no re-rings this is going to be my signature drum um, what's the top head g1 evans g1 i always start with evans g1 if that doesn't sound good i'll try something else but i always start there uh, 1641 Audio Wergs, Lansdale, PA. I should know where that is. It sounds familiar. Um, with the OG MD podcast. Yeah, man, that was a trip. 250 episodes with Mike Johnston. Just finished season three of the Drum Candy podcast. I'm taking a couple weeks to build up some, some interviews and content to get the next season cranking. Oh, yeah, the, um, gosh, the clinic at... Um, what was that winery? That was super fun. I wish I could have been there again this past year. Um, but yeah, we're talking about doing another one somewhere else, I think, soon. So be on the lookout for a clinic over in um, Pennsylvania, outside of Philly, here soon. Um, the pitch, the pitch is the top head? That's a good question. I will let you know right now. Going to dampen the bottom head. Two sixty five hertz, which is just slightly sharp C fourth octave. So pretty low by comparison. Yes, the New Hope Winery, that's where it was. Um, yeah, so it's a C and an F sharp, probably. Maybe it's it's detuned to an F on the bottom by now relatively low this drum is what I, I i got chris to design this with me um there you go i wanted a new drum that would give me all the vibe to kind of of my old vintage like levy and and wfls so i could take this out of the studio and actually use it because this thing is is robust super modern but it sounds like an old drum so i tend to tune the old drums a little bit lower get a warmer sound a little bit wider sound. I do have the wires pretty tight. I've been in kind of a tight wires mode. It kind of makes it, there's a certain spot where it almost chokes, but it just makes the drum kind of expand in a cool way. I've been in that mode, especially in this room. I think it's important. If I go lose wires, it just rattles a ton, but I'll try that so you can hear it. I'll loosen the wires. Like right there, it kind of fattens up again. That's where this drum has been living. I've been wanting to do a full demo of it, but it just sounds too good. I don't want to mess with it. But this is to be a signature drum for me um, from Bucks County Drums. It would be the the new drum to get if you want a vintage sound, looking sound, 
without taking those old squirrely vintage drums out to gigs and stuff. Relic series, special, special edition, I guess. Let's see if in this one. And Black Diamond Pearl is my favorite vintage wrap. I feel like it's one that most people, a lot of people overlook or don't like because it's kind of it's kind of weird which is why I love it I love the weirder stuff yeah so more info on that um, but yeah I'm gonna log off because I've got a ton of work to do in fact I've got a couple calls to make here so it's Tuesday have a good rest of the day and I think I'll be back on at noon again tomorrow so have a good one, and I'll see you then.